Thank you for inviting organisers. Um, today, uh, I'm going to uh, give you a whistle-stop tour, if you like, of the year 1919 in terms of uh, the tumult that was, uh, was actually in the world. And I will look very specifically at the experience of um, the struggle for independent working class adult education, which I'll probably just refer to as independent working class education. Um, in Scotland and to some extent beyond. Okay, 1919 was, was, was certainly a tempestuous year. Uh, it was year two of the Russian Revolution, and yeah. emanating from that, emanating from that, <laughs> let's hear it from the Russian Revolution. Yeah. Yeah. So it was year two of the Russian I didn't expect that kind of crowd to go. Uh, year two. <laughs> Still year two of the Russian Revolution, um, and there was a revolutionary wave of working class struggle that was engulfing the world at this point. Uh, um, there was lots of stuff happening. My struggle. Thank you. So 1919 was a year of revolutions. Um, there was the German Revolution that had begun in 1918 and effectively uh, brought the uh, First World War to an end. Um, there were um, Soviet or council republics in uh, different parts of Germany, uh, particularly Bavaria and Saxony, and at times there was a virtual civil war going on. There was a short-lived Hungarian revolution in 1919, um, and across the Atlantic, um, because it was a worldwide wave of struggles and uh, uh, revolutionary upsurges, um, there were the Seattle and Winnipeg general strikes, and Seattle uh, general strike involved, uh, I think, around 100,000 workers who, in response to deteriorating conditions at the end of the war, uh, heightening of prices of goods and um, poor housing, um, went on, on the, the first general strike in, in, in that part of North America, and they effectively run Seattle as the civil authority they had collapsed and they ran it for about six days. The Winnipeg general strike was about um, six weeks long. There was a similar level of kind of struggle. We tend not to think about the, the, the struggles that have been uh, in Europe at that time as actually being not just Europe, even but worldwide. Bringing it a whole lot closer, there was the Irish independence struggle uh, that was at its height in that point. Uh, and in, in including in that works, uh, work, particular working class struggles uh, that expressed themselves in the establishment of Soviets, partly in, uh, in replication of what was happening in Russia and in Germany. Um, there was uh, police strikes in London, which would eventually uh, lead to the banning of police trade unions. Uh, there was the Dover mutiny of uh, demobilised or demobilising sailors. There were riots right across the UK in response to deteriorating conditions post-war. Uh, riots in my own hometown of Coventry, Luton, and possibly most famously in Liverpool, where there were, of course, tanks on the street. Mm. And here in uh, Glasgow, uh, at the same time as in in Belfast, there were engineering strikes and uh, strikes of uh, shipbuilders and so forth. Okay, but well, we've got to go even further back in time to really understand the origins of independent working class education. In 1899, Ruskin College in Oxford was established, my alma mater. Is that how you pronounce it, alma mater? Um, and uh, it, was, it was established to give uh, working class men. Uh, there were no women students until 1919, uh, a liberal Oxford-style education. So although it was linked to the trade union movement, it couldn't be considered a, a sort of a trade union type college. Prior to the First World War, there was something uh, that is now described as the syndicalist revolt. So it was a kind of a rank and file upsurge um, in the working class uh, right across the UK. 
And it was reflected at Ruskin College. And there was a character called Noah, uh, Noah Albert, who was a South Wales miner, who objected to the economics that was taught at Ruskin College being laissez-faire, pro-capitalist economics, and argued and indeed started uh, lecturing in Marxian economics. This resulted ultimately uh, when the, the college came down on this kind of behaviour in the stu student strike of 1907 and the plebs, what's known as the plebs revolt, uh, the foundation of the plebs league, which was an independent working class educational establishment. And at the birth of, uh, I would say, uh, recognisable independent working class education with the Central Labour College being established. Uh, in England at that time. So, my story. Uh, can't really not talk about the Workers' Educational Association, not least if they're workers in the title. Uh, the WEA had been established uh, in 1903 with similar kind of, uh, a similar kind of ethos to the uh, Ruskin College project, uh, but unfortunately it never really took off in Scotland. The first a uh, branch of the Workers' Educational Association was established in Springburn, but by 1909 it, it collapsed, and it didn't really re-emerge until 1912 with uh, uh, branches in Edinburgh. And indeed, the WEA is certainly up until uh, the 1920s, its strength lay almost entirely on the East Coast, particularly in Edinburgh itself. So in 1918-1919, uh, that academic year, the WA was only able to run six classes in the whole of Scotland, five in Edinburgh and one in Aberdeen. 1919 also saw the WA reach out to the Trade Union Congress and the establishment of the Trade Union Committee. The WA were really, really into partnership working. They were really good at like, reaching out to other educational organisations, particularly in university extramural projects. And that's one of the <coughs> picture there is of uh, the WA meeting with some uh, academics from the University of Oxford in 1907. Oh, you do Okay, so from Scotland, we're in Scotland at last. Um, Scotland in 1919 was a very uh, interesting place to be, to say the least. There would be uh, January uh, strikes, up to 70,000 workers, mostly engineers and shipyard workers. This strike was, was organised almost unofficially, uh, semi-officially through the, the, what would then, then be described as the Scottish Workers Committee, a rank and file trade union body, and uh, also by the Association of uh, the Malcolmite Society of Engineers. And this led to events such as Bloody Friday and so forth in George Square that are quite famous. Around this time also we saw the earliest developments towards the establishment of a communist party uh, under the influence of the Russian Revolution. Major factor in the development of the Scottish Labour College is uh, probably Scotland's most famous uh, socialist, John McLean. And there was a preparatory conference established in 1916 to set up a Scottish Labour College like the Central Labour College in England. But for the time being, between 1916 and 19, the, uh, most of the adult independent working class education was undertaken by the Plebs League uh, members, who, who were based uh, mostly in Fife, particularly in Cowden Beef, uh, therefore minors. Um, and adult education provision was provided by the Plebs League and the Socialist Labour Party in the central halls, which I actually walked past today, St. Mungo's, as far out as Dumbarton, about Silvershot, and also in Falkirk and several parts of Fife. Um, so the, the Scottish Labour College stood essentially in opposition to the kind of working class education that the Workers' Education Association were providing. They were partisan. They believed in teaching a Marxian version of economics. They were socialist in politics. And they believed in independence from the established um, educational uh, organisations such as the universities and so forth. This picture, the dude in the middle at the front, that is, of course, John McLean, 
pretty much everybody behind him, and these are tutors and uh, students, and a lot of students became tutors, and I think pretty much all of those people there are minors. Not were minors, but they were minors at the time. Sorry, this is a very fast whistle stop to it, but 1990 and 1920 is sort of the first proper year of the Scottish Labour College. And the problem that they faced between 1960 and 1919 was partly at least money. It was getting money out of the trade union movement because basically with workers in struggle and so forth, the unions were having to support their own members. And also there was an element of shall we say, slight distrust of these kind of Marxist agitators that were in the Pledge League and so forth. But eventually they got enough money together to get accommodation in two places at the same time. Uh, one was the Liberty Rooms, the home of the Glasgow anarchists at the time, and in the Scottish Business Training College in Bath Street. So it was quite a, a contrast there. It must be quite interesting if people went to their own places. So the Monday to Friday evening classes were a massive success but the day classes were a much limited, much more limited success and had to be abandoned. Can you imagine why that was? Yes, people had to go to work. So, amongst the students were McLean, worth a mention, William McLean, John Brady, and of course Helen Crawford, uh, a very famous uh, Glasgow socialist who had been involved in the rent strikes in 1915 and went on to become a leading member of the Communist Party. There were 30 classes in Glasgow over two semesters and a total of about 180, uh, sorry, 854 students in Glasgow alone in the first semester. And what did they teach? They taught economics, of course, history, English composition, maths, uh, public speaking, shorthand, political science, cooperation, imperialism and world revolution, of course, no other education. Uh, curriculum is, is a proper curriculum without that one. And, uh, and Esperanto, right? Uh, there was a certain opposition to the teaching of Esperanto. Uh, even then, some people thought it was a bit of a waste of time. It was really quite central to the Scottish Labour College's curriculum. And it was a big success. But it wasn't just in Glasgow. Maestro. Thank you. Um, so, uh, in that first year, there were 51 classes out with um, Glasgow. They were mostly in mining areas, Lightshire, like Renfrewshire, Ayrshire, but also up in Aberdeen. They started moving into the WA territory in, on the west, on the east coast, Edinburgh, Dundee, Fife, and Stirlingshire. So uh, it wasn't just a Glasgow phenomenon. They didn't want it to be. They wanted it to be a uh, 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 for the entirety of Scotland. Maestro. <laughs> right, so a little bit about after 90. How long have we got? You've got a good five minutes to find. I better slow down then. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> after 1990. <laughs> uh, uh, on a global level, right, there was a waning of the revolutionary wave. It really reached its high point in 1919, and it carried on into 2021, right through to 23 in different parts of the world. But this was reflected uh, in the uh, movement for independent working class education as well, as a different kind of perspective started to, to emerge. Um, in 1919, it felt like the revolution was upon us, right? It, the actual, uh, the, the, the workers' revolution was imminent, okay? And that was reflected in the, po in the politics of the independent working class educators. Um, However, as, as those things died down and were defeated in many ways, uh, they became uh, a lot, of, they, they developed a lot of political struggles on the left, and a lot of sectarianism, a lot of internecine kind of fight. I can't imagine, we don't have any of that nowadays, so just in the olden days they have that. Um, and McLean, John McLean became very marginalised. He was in and out of prison. Uh, quite a lot for various reasons, including, you know, like kind of sedition and stuff. And while he was in prison, uh, people did actually uh, conspire against them, kind of marginalise him. Uh, there's a lot we could talk about that we don't have time today. So eventually, people started moving into the uh, Scottish Labour College who were more moderate. 
uh, people from people on the, uh, the right wing of the Independent Labour Party, or a mass party in Glasgow at the time, and sent most of the MPs to up the Labour movement to Westminster, and also from the Labour Party itself. In 1921, the Scottish Labour College, affiliated with the National uh, Council of Labour Colleges, which is probably not that clean itself, uh, and in 1926, the Plebs League, which had had a, an independent existence up until then, both in, in uh, Scotland and the rest of the UK, it was absorbed into the uh, NCLC. In a certain ironic twist, uh, the National, Labor, uh, National Council of Labour Colleges uh, eventually was uh, amalgamated with the UEA's Trade Union Committee in 1964. So between the 1920s and the 1960s, the NCLC was, the, uh, in Scotland, as in the rest of the UK, the independent working class um, education provider. Um, there's some numbers that I thought I should give. Yeah, so the, the Scottish Labour uh, Council, uh, Scottish Labour College grew and grew, it attracted far more trade union funding as the years went on and recruited more and more students. So that by 1924-25, for example, they had close to 6,000 uh, students enrolled in 224 classes in Scotland. Um, so it, we can say that at its, at its high point, uh, it was a, a massive success, uh, in, in, certainly in Scotland and uh, beyond. <coughs> Um, I must have run out of time now. Yeah, um, okay. <laughs> Very upside down, maestro. Um, and the question is, it says 2.2, but that was just a clarify. Um, is there, yeah, so if there were two questions that I had for the audience, and they might fire back at me, who knows, is, um, is there an independent working class education revival? Is that going on as we speak? Uh, maybe even here today, who knows? And um, two, if there is, what has to be different about independent working class education today, given the developments in grassroots from below education, not just in the UK, but also in Scotland, but across the world? There's your questions, folks. <laughs> <laughs>